good evening. My name is Helen Lewis. I'm Associate Editor of the New Statesman and I'm hosting tonight's discussion. We've got three phenomenal panellists. Dr Alice Evans researches gender and inequality and global production networks, whatever they turn out to be, at King's College London. Emma Penny is an editor at Navarra and Red Pepper magazine and Nash Shah is the Labour MP for Bradford West and the Shadow Minister for Women and Equalities. Um, Eleanor, as you've seen the plan, I'm going to start with you first. <laughs> How much of that Chekhov's idea about domesticity is still recognisable today? How much do those themes still resonate today? I think um, Chekhov is particularly interesting in his analysis of how even the aspirations of a kind of lower, lower bourgeois kind of world world picture even those when fulfilled are totally hollow and totally alienating and particularly isolating for women it kind of is a very useful rubric when unpacking kind of more modern updates of these kinds of ideas like the idea of having it all or the idea of being a domestic goddess or all these kinds of ways of repackaging what are essentially very kind of reactionary victorian ideals of being a woman and showing those up for actually these are ways of channeling very intimate human impulses for love, for fulfilment, for work that seems meaningful into forms that are convenient for the structures of power. Alice, on your, I mean, I was being mean about global production networks, sorry, <laughs> but I think what's interesting about your research is you do look at exactly this stuff, right? You look at how women's unpaid labour, predominantly women's unpaid labour in the home, contributes to what we think of as production. How does that, how does that work? Right, okay, so um, so I did a lot of research in Zambia, in Cambodia, and Vietnam. And for a long time, like, so for example, I think one of, um, I think women's unpaid care work, both in rural and in urban areas, is, I think this is actually a global phenomenon, that it's rarely seen, it's rarely recognised, it's rarely applauded, it's rarely valued. You know, in Zambia, there's a, a, fr a phrase to describe housewife is, well, quick alafie, and that means just sitting. What's she doing? Oh, she's just sitting. Like, it's not even recognised as all that backbreaking labour, that monotonous, that important work, that imp fundamentally important work of keeping families together, making sure that they're fit and healthy and ready for the mines in Zambia, for example. Well, quick alafie. And I think that's, you know, that's a global theme, perhaps. I think that's fascinating, because I often I know lots of people who are new parents, and quite often they will say to me, like, I'm so happy to be going back to work. <laughs> yeah. like, I can sit in my office and no one disturbs me. And like, I can go to the loo whenever I want and no one is screaming. Only people are occasionally screaming. Like, <laughs> but actually that idea that being at home is somehow leisure by yeah. its very nature is a kind of fascinating, persistent one. Now, as I've got to pick you up on this, we were talking earlier about the fact that you don't use your dishwasher, despite having a dishwasher, which is a fascinating concept to me that you wouldn't just sometimes just put things on just for fun. Um, but what is that about? Is there a kind of do you think that feminism is down on people who enjoy domesticity? Because we fought so hard to get out of the domestic sphere. Do we now just downgrade it and stigmatise it? I think sometimes in some places it is stigmatised. For me, it's important because of a London water. I have to run the dishwasher once a month, but that's about it because it might get stuck. You know, and but on a serious note, I really, really enjoy my cooking, my cleaning, and I was saying earlier, I was kind of conditioned into my teenage years in a village in Pakistan. I, you know, I, I was in a forced marriage at 15, so I was conditioned into, this is the role of a woman, you should be behaving in such a way, you should be able to cook, clean, do all the rest of it. But now, as an adult, I'm, I'm, make, I'm doing it out of choice, which is much more liberating rather than it's an expectation of me to do it. I genuinely enjoy. I enjoyed the domestic side of being able to cook for my children, to be able to feed them, and that whole idea of cleaning. And some of it is in, is inherited, but some of it I genuinely enjoy. Do you ever resent it? I've just been working on some stuff about the seventies movement for wages for housework, which was this big kind of Marxist demand that women should get paid, which has now come back in the form of things like discussions of universal basic income, the idea that everyone should get a flat fee. And some of the writing, Jill Tweedy wrote in The Guardian about it, you know, I don't want to engage with what wages for housework because I know that thinking about it would make me resent my husband and my sons because as soon as I open that box of thinking, why am I picking your socks up again, I begin to hate the people that I live with. No, I wouldn't. I don't resent it at all. I love, I love for, for me, uh, being a mother, I've got two boys and a girl and I think it's really, really important that they understand they have responsibilities, my boys as well as my daughter, and I... And I you know, for me, it's about giving my children the opportunities that I never had. And some of that will be 
me doing extra work and that's fine for me I see that as me being my being, being, a, being a mother because my mum did so much for me and I, I kind of and, and it might not fit in with the, that, that kind of idea but that for me is very whether it's cultural whether it's for, for me I just think I just see that as my role kind of thing so it doesn't I don't resent it at all that's good I, I mean I, feel free to chip in do either of you two do you how do you feel about housework about domesticity I mean I think first off we shouldn't we shouldn't be proponents of a kind of feminism which is grounded on rejecting everything that's feminine, right? That just replays a kind of set of um, cultural hierarchies which um, validates things considered masculine, like competition, lack of care, dominance, etc. And really, if we're going to, you know, haul the world out of the various crises and messes that we're in, we need to be recentering um, all of our political conversations around um, ethics and economies of work and care because um, as Alice was saying like those are the most fundamental kinds of work that there is both in our private lives and in the formal economy but um, I think what Naz was saying was very, was very interesting about how do we wrangle with the fact with the very personal political fact that these kinds of caring economies on which all profit is based on which all productive labor is based is very much bound up with caring for people that we love and how on earth do you steer between um, the two horns of that problem right making a demand that uh, means that we can properly share out the burdens of work which overwhelmingly fall to women overwhelmingly fall to working class women in particular without rejecting the idea of care per se and without kind of analyzing all human relations as well, I should be doing this for a wage. Well, I should be doing this for uh, for money. Because I think that's kind of a a quite alienating, quite sort of shriveled way of understanding human relations. So, how do you feel about something like that, like that wages for housework demand that has now turned into UBI? Um, wages for housework, I find very interesting because um, uh, Maria Rossadella Costa and Silvia Federici, who were some of the people who uh, were, you know the main proponents of it very much thought of it as a, as a challenge, not necessarily as a political demand per se, and it warped into things that we would now recognise as uh, very important gains for the feminist movement, like, um, uh, what's it called, child benefit. Um, and so I think it's, it's very much a question that provokes uh, a very fundamental analysis and a reshaping of the way we think about work and say, like, actually, this is very important productive labour and that kind of thing. And these are precisely the questions that we need to be asking right now. But I'm not so sure that wages for housework is the answer to those questions that it provokes. Right, which is how I feel about it, is that it, what it did was try and say, let's talk about all this work that's being done that is invisible, that is not is, you know, implicitly downgraded, that is just assumed to happen. And it had to happen at the moment in the 70s that it did, because that was at, you know, the point at which a huge number of women ent ended up entering the workforce. Mm -hmm. And actually what Ali Hoshtar calls the second shift. Somebody had to go home at the end of their working day for money and do all the other stuff that was still required. And trying to make those negotiations was, was harder. And I spoke to her recently about it, and she said, well, what's changed between when I wrote that book in the 70s and now is the expectation, even if it doesn't happen, but the expectation that it is a shared thing between men and women, right? That actually women don't own the home anymore, that like actually, even if the jobs end up not being distributed 50-50, there, like, there is an expectation you would at least try and strive towards that, Yeah, right? and, and precisely kind of shattering the bounds of, you know, what we think of as private and public, you know, the private is the feminine sphere that, you know, is dominated by women, public is dominated by men who do powerful things and go out to work, um, etc. And that's the kind of, those are the kind of debates that really struck me in watching the play, because when people write about the second shift from a very kind of personal experiential standpoint, the thing that stands out again and again is the fact that exhaustion is the kind of primary mode through which the lived experience of being a woman mm. is, you know, is, is channeled, right? And everyone is exhausted all of the time and the biggest transitional demand that you could ask for in feminism is just five minutes bloody lie down. Right, there's this brilliant phrase by a Dutch comedian, which is, my grandmother didn't have the vote, my mother didn't have the pill, and I don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of encapsulates that thing about this. In some respects, we have it all, but only by, by doing it all. Alice, I'm interested, because you work with women in developing countries, for whom, you know, that, they're earlier on, largely, in that transition, right? They, they're, they're grappling with 
something that in this country more people were grappling in the 70s and before. What is it like to talk to people who have a much more traditional idea of domesticity? Um, so, I think that I don't know, first of all, I'm not sure that it's the case that all the places where I go to there is necessarily a more traditional idea of domesticity than in the UK. Mm. Um, and in going back to your point about not having the time, so for example, when I do work in Cambodia, there's much more equality of leisure, like women being able to go and play, women being able to go to the cafe, and that being fine. What, what enables that? Um, so I think the really catalytic force that's global is cities. And coming to cities, so whereas rural areas, there's a sort of homogeneity, you might not be aware of alternatives, you see what your mother does, you see what your neighbours do, and those practices aren't contested, so they live on for generations because you don't really think there's an alternative to it. But then when I speak to rural urban migrants and they come to the city, so for example, a garment worker in Cambodia, and she heard that uh, a guy in the dormitory was doing the washing up, she was like, maybe I'll push my husband to do that too, because they come to cities and they see these things. So she asked her husband, she was like, yeah, I think we should share this stuff. And he said, no. And so she divorced him. <laughs> she was like, I think this is the way things should be organized. I've got my own money because I'm a garment worker, and hell no, am I going to put up with that? Um, so there's all that kind of resistance happening, um, especially through association, diversity, listening and learning from different women. Um, so I think these gender ideas of domesticity can be interrupted, you know, by sharing and thinking, well, you know, that's not necessarily the only way of doing things. I think that's a fascinating anecdote, because it chimes with stuff that I've heard from people in the UK. Uh, uh, someone I know said to me, you know, I've... I've got three kids and a husband, actually, I feel like I've got four kids. And actually, if I divorced him, I'd feel like I'd have one less person to look after, right? So these are issues that really drive people, like, completely to the, to the brink, because they are about the very fabric of, of your life. Now, I want to ask you, because you're a woman in public life, right? And this is the other side of this. If we traditionally said that the home is where women are, then there is still something seen as being slightly alien about being a very high-profile woman in politics, for example. You are not the norm. Definitely not. Right? <laughs> you not walk into the House of Commons and see lots of people who look like you, right? That's no. just a fact. What is that experience like? For me, I, I, you know, I, I, I beat George Galloway to get into Parliament, so I'm kind of like... Oh, you know, round of applause, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, so my transition into politics was definitely not normal. I was very much a rookie politician. Or oh, to me, it was just like the honour of being able to represent my constituents. And I, and I came from a... Der I didn't come up to political roots. So I think... The, the, the nicest way to put it is you, less, you have less BS to unlearn when you come from that place. And then and you can kind of like carve your own identity as an adult because you know a lot more. So I'm in a very privileged position and, I, and I, there's not a day when I don't understand that and I don't remind myself of that. But I think the other thing for me, which I think we've missed here for, for, for in this conversation so far, is the role of a single parent because I am a single parent. So I don't have the luxury of having to, to the other half to kind of like take on the issue of the children and, and share that responsibility at home. Um, so it's, you, you kind of like do become a superwoman, you do want that five minutes, and, but I have an amazing 15 year old, an amazing 12 year old who, kind, who get it, you know, who get that life is, is not, they, they have a very, very good appreciation and understanding of gratitude of, yes, it's hard, but um, boy, it's an amazing position to be in. But if I'm remembering rightly, your mum is quite helpful to you, right? Which is an interesting contrast with some of the more traditional setups of society where people maybe live more closely with their parents, yeah. right? We've set up these very atomised mm -hmm. nuclear families where people often live miles away from, you know, support networks. You might be able to help them yeah. out. You, without your mum, you would be in a real... So, so my mum, now that I've moved my children to London since September, my mum comes usually when we've got long votes for Brexit, so we know that we've got Brexit going on, so my mum will come down for a week. Uh, next week she's going to come down for a week because I've got a busy week, so I usually try and cram in lots and lots of work in the constituency when my mum's here looking after the children, so she'll come down. Um, but it is like a militarised operation, so on Saturday when we went up, so on Friday, the kids, and this is honestly, this is literally how it is. Friday, they came back from school. They, it's the only time we can get family swimming in, so I took the kids swimming. 
So the uniforms don't get washed till when I get come back from swimming. Then I, um, they're on the radiator. I've ironed them at four o'clock in the morning because I've oh, got to get on the train at eight o'clock. Do you know what I mean? So you kind of like get it, and it's literally when military you precision. Sleep, yeah. So you, you kind of like get an hour on the train, and I can do power naps. I've really mastered power naps. <laughs> but you know, so then you've got you you've got to go to the constituency. You've got your meetings, and in the constituency, it's helpful because their father's in the constituency, my family's in the constituency. I've got on tap childcare. It's bloody brilliant. But when the, when now we're at school here, it has made it's doubled up my workload by getting bringing my kids to here. But then I see them every morning. Mm -hmm. And I walk my child to school every morning, which is something that I've missed three years. He was only two and a half, three when I came into politics. So I've missed three years. And it is, you have to. It's a, this element of sacrifice that you've got to do to be able to do public life. Uh, and it is a privilege, but it does eat into that time, you know, of your children and all the rest of it, which I really, really value. But do you get comments like the kind of classic anti-feminist, you know, get back in the kitchen, make me a sandwich, kind of that sort of stuff still thrown at you? God, no. Nobody dare. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, Helen, if I may just comment one thing, I think the one of the background important points is our ways of dealing with the burden of care work is partly mediated by what we think is possible. So, Naz, you correct me if I'm uh, mm. misinterpreting here, but you're like, if you've got this crisis, you've got this huge burden of care work, well, let me ask my family to help, let me juggle a few yeah. things, let me take in less sleep. And that's very much an individual level coping strategy. Yeah. Rather than thinking, well, the state should be the one stepping into, you know, I should have free access to care work anytime I need it, my kids should be in free, excellent quality care, right you know, uh, uh, early childcare, etc. And the, and our expectations of the state, if our expectations of the state are so low that we think that we should take that burden ourselves, if we don't see the state intervening, then we sort of, you know, adopt this neoliberal mindset that we have to do it all ourselves. So it's really that we become so despondent, we become so passive, we become so fatalistic that we think, right, Naz, let, you know, how do I cope with this situation? I'll just do more and more and more until exhaustion. I mean, I think that's precisely um, precisely my problem with wages for housework as a solution, right? Because even if you're getting paid with it, you, you're not unpacking the fundamental question of who's doing the work, which is, to my mind, the more fundamental like, axis of oppression, the more fundamental axis of inequality there, like who's shouldering the burden of this you know, vast social responsibility without which society totally grinds to a halt, because even if you're getting, getting paid for it, you're not really challenging state power um, that much and you know you're completely right I think um, that kind of universal um, basic childcare as opposed to a kind of universal basic income like obviously in an ideal world we wouldn't have to choose but th that's the kind of that's the kind of um, like practical horizon that I would like to see so that kind of you know we do have more time to spend with our families that are that involve like going swimming and rather than like ironing at four o'clock in the morning or like you know my mum was commuting to from Brighton where I grew up to Bristol to take care of her uh, mum when in the last few months of her life because there was just no social care and again it's that it's 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 warping this instinct of love and care into something that just feels so unmanageable. I think that's the really interesting thing because I'm sure some people listening to this will think well hang on a minute you know God, what's wrong with you know, loving people this idea of that you should be selfless or if you love your kids of course you should love looking after them and I'm sure everybody loves their children mm -hmm. it doesn't make changing a nappy any more enjoyable <laughs> as a job particularly right <laughs> and I also sort of feel about you know my day job I really enjoy that but I still quite enjoy getting paid for it thanks you know yeah. so, but there is always this kind of invocation about the idea that women particularly women should be sort of selfless right they should be self-sacrificing that if you don't want to give up absolutely everything for your children then you've somehow kind of failed as a mother which I don't think we apply to dads in the same way right the model for dads is much more be the breadwinner be the one who brings home you know, like that's where you invest yourself were. Yeah, I mean, this is um, in Latin America, in Mexico, in Brazil. They have something a little bit similar to wages for a uh, housewife. It's called conditional cash transfers. So the money is given once a month to the woman, the mother, um, and in exchange, the kids have to go to school and they have to go to health clinics. And the money is given to women on the presumption of maternal altruism. There is the idea that women are so altruistic, they will not spend it on nice things for themselves, they will put all the money back in the household. Because men are vilified as these, you know, people who might, might spend on alcohol and, you know, uh, girlfriends, even though there's no evidence for that. But it's the idea, that these cash transfers reinforce these expectations that women will sacrifice themselves for the families and that we, women should be 
trusted to deal with it, which of course is incredibly regressive. Right? That's really interesting to me though, because that is basically the presumption of the way that the UK benefit system works. So we were talking about child benefit earlier, big fight by Barbara Carson, yeah. people like that, to say it goes in the purse, not in the wallet, because it, it would have been much easier to add it onto men's pay packets, but no, the idea was it went to the primary care, who's then predominantly a woman. The same thing with the idea, you know, the idea that I talk to people who's, you know, my mother's generation who found out that their, you know, their parents had running away funds, right? That they stashed away from their pin money. That was the little bit of money that was handed over to them. So there is still something quite radical about the state giving money directly to women for care and responsibilities, right? Yeah. I, I completely agree and was about to bring up precisely that point. I think one of the one of the main um, uh, one of the main kind of arguments for paying into the person, not the wallet, was. Um, is that this is a kind of, it, it's not just a payment for work in that kind of basic transactional sense, it's also about kind of rebalancing the power in the home, more generally speaking. And a lot of women have used that as cash funds to get out of um, abusive relationships. It's a very, very practical means of rebalancing um, the power in that sense. So in that sense, I think, you know, obviously that that's where the state should be intervening to, to say that, you know, the, there are these like necessary power imbalances, even within the most loving relationships, which is very hard to confront, right? Like, you, you know, if you are in, uh, if you're a woman in a heterosexual relationship, um, it can be the most loving, cherishing, um, nurturing thing on the planet. And unfortunately, love doesn't necessarily conquer all in these cases. No, and, there, and there are just these power dynamics that, um, can't be resolved um, simply in the in the crux of a nuclear family, and where we should be making greater demands from society, from the state to step in, and you know, perhaps you know, I mean, like as I think Shulamith Firestone was saying that these kinds of uh, these kinds of state programs they seem very kind of bureaucratic, they seem very um, brutish and alienating, but really these are what allow love to flourish because it's not kind of complicated by all the bullshit. Yeah. I think there's a parallel debate with income inequality. So some people would say, right, what do we do with a society of income inequality? We have two options. Either we can give greater redistribution, social transfers to the poorest, or we can change the way the economy actually functions and ensure there are more good jobs. So those, you know, one is productive, one is, one, one is redistributive. And I think the, that maps on to the debate about gender inequality and women being, do you adjust for women being in a precarious, vulnerable situation, abusive marriages that they, uh, and, and address that by wages for housework? Or do you sort out the economy so that the terrible jobs that women are clustered in are actually paid better, better regulated? What would that look like though? Because there is a fundamental problem in that jobs done by women by their nature end up being crappy jobs that aren't yes. very well valued. Yes. So whatever you want to say about it care work, because it's a sector that is dominated by women, that in itself drives the wages down, right? We know that Absolutely. computer coding became much more prestigious as a career when it stopped being like, people thought it was typing done by women, and then they thought it was maths that was done by men, and the wages... <laughs> yeah, 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 the skyrocketed. So <laughs> how do you do that? The fact that just work done by women is by nature, people go, women's work, it's not real work, it's women's work. Oh, right, okay, so how do we fix gender inequalities in the labour market? No problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said that was <laughs> I think, okay, so there are some really interesting ideas, um, wage boards. So in Australia, they have wage boards for specific sectors. So a minimum wage protects the absolute poorest. A wage board would be for a sector specific, and then you would raise the wages within that sector. So they have it in Australia, and that's another idea that you could tag it into a specific sector and raise the wages um, in that way, because in a lot of these sectors, especially done done those by women, you have some monopsony markets. Sorry, bad academic term. If you have a case where you have lots of... Monopsony. <laughs> Monopsony. Oh, no where does it come on? <laughs> right, so, anyway, so this idea of wage boards is a way of raising the wages where you have very precarious workers to make sure that they're better protected. Okay. And tackling things like um, outsourcing of care work. So, and, and I think the biggest, most important thing here is collective action. So the independent workers of Great Britain have done phenomenal work in organising very precarious outsourced cleaners in the universities of London, for example, and making sure they get... I think that in itself is a really interesting point, though, because we know that council budgets have been one of the most hardest hit things for yes. spending cuts, right? And that adult social care is a huge... Has enormous, enormous cuts to it. Yes. But what fundamentally happens if you can't get your 
mother, father, you know, your adult child cared for, you can't go out and march because you're there yeah, caring sure. for them all yeah. the time. It's like a, another reiteration of that fundamental problem of feminism. There's just not enough hours in the day to do it with all the other stuff you've got to do. Mm-hmm. Now, apart from, um, you mentioned those long Brexit votes, and I'm very sorry to m- mention this again, but <laughs> how much of a sense do you get that any of this is on the, the political agenda at all? You know, the party's make an offer on childcare, 15 hours, 20 hours. But I don't hear any of this stuff. In you the won't. political conversation. But then right now, the vortex is Brexit. Right. You know, that is, the, that is what's consuming. It is absolutely depressing that we're not focused on policies. We're not focused on, you know, it's kind of like sucks the energy out of Parliament right now. Um, and then when you get a breather because she's kicked for date a bit further down and now we've got the European election, but then you know, you just get that breather and then you try and do something, but you know you've got to, it, it is, you, we haven't got the time to talk about. We, we haven't got the time or the ability to talk about in, in Parliament, debating all of these and getting all... You know, when it, today was, is Monday. We should have a, a vote, ideally. We should be passing legislation. When was the last when time there was a vote in the House of Commons? Well, I think um, it was a couple of weeks ago. It wasn't last week. I don't think <laughs> there was a week, uh, vote last week. It was either Brexit or um, some of them are just... Uh, votes because we think we, we might need to like the over the over 65 some licensing somebody might want to call a vote on it or somebody might want to call a vote on something else but really we're just not doing legislative work we're not doing any of that we're not having we're not even having the right debates right we've got all yeah. these big problems yeah. and yet there's there's no nope. it's either brexit or nothing there's your two options right now on. it's brexit we you raise it so one of the the last few times in uh, at the dispatch box i've raised the issue of the gender pay gap and it, it's a continuous thing about yes the government says we we're asking for it to be reported on but it's not been made compulsory a couple of weeks ago that was my question it was why aren't we making it compulsory for people yes you're asking people to report it but why aren't we making it compulsory it's only when you start making it compulsory that you will get the real picture and then that the gender and then if you look at underneath gender you've got the bain pay gap it's even worse so if, you, if you're a woman, an ethnic minority woman, and if you work in the care, you've got that one whammy of being a woman, and then you've got another whammy mm-hmm. of being a BME woman, or, you know, from a different background, but they're not doing it. Okay, Ellen, my question to you is, you're, um, you hang out with the young cool people on the radical left. How much attention <laughs> are they paying <laughs> to, through these, the window. Be, yeah, exactly, to these kind of issues, right? Because it, it has been a classic problem of feminism that actually the left thinks that it owns feminism, right? That, it, that actually everybody, everyone who's a feminist you should be left-wing. But there is also a tendency to be like, but we'll get to your issues, we've just got a couple of other things to sort out first, like all the other stuff. Yeah. Is this kind of stuff on the agenda <laughs> at, at Novara, at places like that? Um, I, happily, in my like delightful little bubble in the left, which you know I occasionally poke my head out of, um, it's, very, it's very scary, I'm like, puts Tony Phil. Um, but uh, yeah, this is like very much on the agenda because questions of rearranging the way that um, work is structured uh, in a, like, a very thoroughgoing sense to not only reduce the reduce the working week not only make sure that everyone gets paid a living wage not only kind of uh, a green jobs deal but also to think about work in a more in a more expansive sense that includes uh, women's work is absolutely absolutely fundamental to a lot of questions of, around migrant organizing um, as Alice was saying the amazing work that's being done with uh, especially like new unions like IWGB um, fundamental to uh, thinking what like race means in modern Britain and those conversations are really um really lively really inspiring and um driving a lot of the debate at the moment but i think what where that hasn't necessarily translated into is um a real pickup by um let's say the labor party because there is this kind of like bizarre bizarre kind of post hoc assumption that you know a lot of people who um I was kind of you know skiving school with to go on the uh, tuition fees demo back in like 2010 Good God, um, are now in sort of positions of power in the Labour Party, which is absolutely baffling to me because I've seen them when uh, they've seen them at parties and they are no use to anyone. Um, uh, but that's like an after hours thing people can ask me. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Little, little cold sack there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, and so there is this assumption that um, kind of my sector of the left or whatever, um, what our conversations uh, will 
inevitably translate into Labour Party policy, when really the Labour Party is a broad church and uh, in which people are openly having fist fights in the pews, and there and that is by far, you know, that is by no means um, a guarantee. And we really need to start taking these very lively conversations, like you know, I was involved in organising the women's strike, um, all these kinds of things. Um, and thinking about, okay, how do we translate these out of kind of academic speak, out of barnstorming, polemicising into actual tangible bread and butter mm. demands like um, full childcare, like rethinking um, uh, uh, wages for housework, like automating some more of uh, domestic labour, that kind of thing. Right. And, you know, how do we translate these into real policy demands that we can take to employers, to the government, etc. And those are the Conversations that aren't really, yeah, <laughs> really happening. Not, we're not talking about pensions either. You know what? It's the women that have been affected by the wasp stuff, yeah. and that is another thing that we, we really, really we're, we're not we're, we're talking about it. We've got the campaigns going, but actually, have we managed to get the government to to back down on the truth? Well, that to me yeah. is the, it's the other half of the childcare conversation, is the elderly yeah. care conversation, yeah. which nobody wants to because it's just too much of a screaming horror yeah. that no one wants to open that box. Before we get to questions, Alice, I just want to ask you: we haven't really talked about men. Oh yeah, and I like to talk about men. <laughs> Um, because I think the flip side of this is if we want to say that you know women need to be given the freedom to get out into the public realm, actually how do we talk to men about domesticity? How do we encourage them to think that actually some of their self-worth and enjoyment in life can come from the home when that's traditionally been something that is you know, off limits to them? Yeah, so I don't know if anyone's seen this film called uh, The Fundamentals of Caring. Uh, it's on Netflix, it's with Paul Rudd. And he's a male paid carer who looks after this disabled kid. Never once in the film do they comment or note that it's slightly weird and unusual to have a male carer. He just does it. And I think that's the incredibly important thing to... Social change accelerates when we see that other people are changing. Mm. So amplifying exposure to men doing care work, having TV programs, having EastEnders with a male caregiver, whether it's unpaid or paid work, showing that it's totally normal, and then men will be more likely to do it because they don't think they'll be mocked and vilified for their peers. So going back to Zambia, um, I was once interviewing this schoolboy, a 14-year-old, and... He swept inside the home, but never outside the home. So in Zambia, where it's like dirt, you have to do the sort of sweeping. I was like, why don't you know it's the same task? You're just moving your brush. He was like, no, if I sweep outside the home, people will see me and they'll mock me. My friends will tease me. But if I do it inside, it's fine. Like, no one's going to mock me. So it's absolutely our expectations of how we think we'll be perceived and treated by others. So if we want men to do care work, it's not the right thing to say, you man must be doing care work, you're a bad man if you don't do it. No, it's amplifying exposure, showing that all your neighbours are caring. And I think this is one of the fascinating things about gender and social change, that it's very asymmetric. So yes, there are inequalities, but over the past five decades, we've seen a rise of women in employment, we've seen a rise of women in top jobs, a rise of women in politics. But the change has been far, far slower inside the home. And that's partly because the work is dirty, low status, etc. But another thing is really important is that nobody sees it. So yes, even though there are some men who share care work, even though there are some men doing the nappies, doing the cleaning, doing the caring, they're not seen by others. So we continue to think it's abnormal, not really done. So the few men who are interested in it don't shout about it, don't know about it, so are more likely to just stay behind the home. So the key then, I think, is to amplify exposure, especially through TV. So thank you very much, and thank you to my panellists. Mm -hmm.